This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. We turn now to China, where a shocking new expose has revealed that Chinese authorities are systematically forcing Muslims, mostly Uyghurs and Kazakhs, into labor programs to supply Chinese factories with a cheap and compliant workforce. The New York Times investigation headlined Inside China's Push to Turn Muslim Minorities into an Army of Workers is based on official documents, interviews with leading experts, and visits to the far western region of Xinjiang, where about half of of the population is Muslim. What it reveals is a sweeping program to push poor farmers, villagers and small traders into sometimes months-long training courses before assigning them to low-wage factory work. The programs work in tandem with indoctrination camps, where an estimated one million adults from the Uyghur community are being imprisoned. China claims its labor programs are designed to combat extremism and alleviate poverty. Uyghur activists say they're part of China's ongoing campaign to strip them of their language and community and carry out nothing short of cultural genocide. The New York Times obtained rare footage taken inside one of China's labor programs. In a far corner of northwestern China, a car drives along a wall lined with barbed wire heading towards what looks like a standard apartment complex. Access here is restricted, and the camera person is filming secretly. Filming is prohibited. Don't film. I'm not going to. I'm just going to follow you inside and take a look. Fine. Because this is no ordinary residence. It's part of a contentious labor resettlement program run by the Chinese government to extend state control over Muslim minorities, mostly Uyghurs, by moving them from one part of China to work in another. This covert, low-quality footage that we've adjusted to reveal some details and obscure others gives us some rare insights into how people in this program live and are indoctrinated. Love the party, love the country, love the family of the Chinese nation, anti-separatism, anti-extremism, anti-violence. Over the last few years, the mass incarceration of more than a million Uyghurs and Kazakhs by the Chinese government has led to international outrage. These labor programs are part of that larger story. That a New York Times expose. For more, we go to Hong Kong, where we're joined by Austin Ramsey, the New York Times reporter who co-authored the recent expose. And in Washington, D.C., we're joined by Nuri Turkel, Uyghur American attorney, board chair of the Uyghur Human Rights Project. We welcome you both to Democracy Now! Austin, let's begin with you. Can you lay out the significance of these documents that you got? Explain where you got them from, hundreds of pages, and what they say. Um, we received uh, hundreds of pages of documents um, from a member of the Chinese political elite that um, revealed the origin of the internment camps in Xinjiang and, and how the, the Chinese leadership um, including Xi Jinping, um, beginning in 2014, pushed for um, a solution to what he saw as um, extremism and, and terrorism and um, violence that needed to be controlled, put under control in Xinjiang. And so he called for a tough solution. And in the years that followed, we saw a beginning of small level internment camps and then beginning in. After 2016, a new party secretary came into Xinjiang and began a large-scale um, internment operation that, that led to the, um, you know, as many as a million people who were put into these camps. Um, the documents also revealed that, uh, you know, publicly, the Chinese government has described these these camps as uh, as training centers to give people skills to help them that will steer them away from extremism. But in the language of the documents themselves, it, it describes these as these programs as punishment, and it shows that the the authorities are are plainly aware of the the suffering that is caused not only to the people in the camps but to their families and and children who who are left without parents. And can you explain um, what these camps are? You've got indoctrination camps, and you've got labor camps. And explain how you were able to document what you say is as many as a million people, uh, Uyghur Muslims, Kazakh Muslims, in these camps. 
Well, there, there are multiple programs happening. There's the internment program, um, which has as many as a million people in these camps. The labor program is separate, but related, and it involves um, taking people from primarily from southern Xinjiang and sending them to northern Xinjiang, to, to other parts of China, um, to work in, in factories, um, to work, as, as the video showed, as, as, as street cleaners, to put them in, in more formal labor, as opposed to often to the farm work that they did before. It's, it's, a, it's a separate system of control, um, not as extreme as the camps themselves, but from everything we've seen, there, there is coercion involved in, in forcing these people into, into this sort of work. These people, um, some of them include family members of people in camps. Um, so, the, so there are connections, and it is related to the overall program of control. Um, but there are many different programs happening in Xinjiang. Well, Austin, earlier you talked about the fact that, um, you know, some of these, when these Uyghurs are disappeared from their homes and they have uh, children who return from study either in, in Hong Kong or other parts of China, they come back and they discover that their family members are gone. What explanation are they given? There's actually a document that's distributed? That's right. That was, that was one of the most telling documents um, in, in the cash that, uh, that we received. And it, it, it outlines basically what uh, local officials in Xinjiang uh, should say to these young people who return home from other parts of China to learn that family members have been put into camps. Um, it was a document from, from 2017, when the program really began ramping up. And it, it told officials to tell um, these young people um, that their family members had it, it uses almost pseudo medical language to say that they've you know they've been infected by a virus and just as if you were uh, infected with an, an actual virus you would you would want a period of treatment um, it, it must be closed treatment um, so that this won't spread to other people um, and it de describes these programs as being for their own benefit. But at the same time, there, there, there's messages that to sort of warn um, these young people that, that they themselves should not complain, because only through their agreement will their family members, um, you know, eventually get out. Austin Ramsey, can you talk about the impact of the forced labor on the global supply chain um, and the participation by stores, including Muji, uh, Uniqlo, Walmart? Well, Xinjiang produces uh, about 80 to 85 percent of China's cotton. Um, China is, of course, a huge clothing manufacturer. Uh, and the government has been trying to uh, increase the amount of clothing and textile produ production in Xinjiang. So, so some of these uh, some of these labor programs in involve uh, clothing and textile factories and are tied with the uh, production of cotton in Xinjiang. And so, uh, Muji and Uniqlo have uh, previously advertised Xinjiang cotton. Um, Muji. Uh, did not respond to us, but they, they said last year that they worked very hard to ensure that there's no forced labor in their supply chain. Uh, Uniqlo said that they do not work with partners in Xinjiang. Um, but but the, the, sh the short answer is that the um, significance of China in, produc in production of all things and uh, the significance of, of Xinjiang in, in terms of clothing and textile production means that uh, it's, it's very risky for companies that have any production connected with Xinjiang and requires really close investigation of their supply chains. Well, I'd like to bring in Nuri Turkel, a Uyghur American attorney and activist, board chair at the Uyghur Human Rights Project. Uh, could you, Nuri, respond to the significance of this expose? Um, the, these are what we uh, lawyers call an evidence. This is uh, not a speculation. This is not a, um, uh, uh, a report done by a third party or NGO. This is an, a, a hard evidence 
uh, comes straight out from the Chinese uh, uh, government's own um, archives. Uh, what we have today is that um, in the past uh, two and a half years, uh, we've been relying on open source information uh, on construction bids and the future expansion of the camps, as well as the personal uh, witness accounts, uh, survivors' accounts, to come up with uh, a, a, a close to a reality figure. But now we have evidence. Uh, these evidence are so significant and so revealing. Uh, several things uh, comes to mind. One is that this is not a local uh, government officials trying to impress the central government and, and formulated these policies. This has come apparently uh, directly coming uh, from the Chinese Communist Party General Secretary Xi Jinping and his local uh, entrusted officials, uh, Chen Zhengguo and others. So um, we've been saying, we've been, uh, this, we these documents seconds, confirm, Mary. these documents have confirmed uh, uh, what we have been telling uh, the world uh, in the last two and a half years, but it's incumbent upon the government officials, uh, lawmakers, uh, judges and prosecutors to look into this uh, to see uh, if this is, uh, constitutes a We're going to do part humanity. two. Uh, thank you to Nuri Turkel, um, as well as to Austin Ramsey of The New York Times.